Okay. <laughs> I'd like to call the Budget Review Committee to order. It's April 11th, 2018. We're in the automatic chamber, and it's now 7 o'clock. Uh, would you, clerk, please call the roll? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Alderman at Lodge, Larry Wiltshire. Here. Alderman at Lodge, Brian McCarthy. Present. Alderman at Lodge, Michael O'Brien is present. Alderman at Lodge, David Tenza. Here. All the women at Lodge, Shoshana Kelly. Here. And Alderman Jan Smith. Here. Okay, and that should do chair. it for the Alderman. Also in attendance, the I chair. have... Oh, yes, yeah, excuse me. The chair is here, Richard Dowd. Excuse present. me. <laughs> and also present is Mayor Jim Donches, uh, Ms. Piaccio, Kim Kleiner, and Mr. Bill Mansfield. <coughs> Oh, excuse me, Alderman Lopez is also in attendance. <laughs> okay. So, period for public comment. I don't see anyone. Communications. There is none. New business. There is none. Unfinished business. There is none. Tabled in committee. Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, make a motion to take from the table R18019. The motion is to take uh, R18019 from the table. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Um, this evening, we're going to be covering general government. Um, the first item is the mayor's office. Appropriations are on page 65. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for having us. So we have the um, first the uh, PowerPoint that I know uh, we are you've been you asked for, mm -hmm. just in terms of our general organization and duties. So Ms. Kleiner will. So here are the uh, people on the mayor's staff: Kim Kleiner, Chief of Staff; Derek Edry. Cecilia Ulibari and Allison Waite, who just started Monday, is the receptionist now. And I will, the next slide just shows you what some of the responsibilities of the chief of staff are. I won't just read the, I won't just read the PowerPoint, but you can see that um, Kim runs the office, you know, manages works on making, helping make decisions, uh, helps with the aldermen and various boards around the city, so has a very responsible, broad position. And now we go to the communications. Uh, this is Derek Edry, um, communicates with the press, with the public, uh, writes the press releases, deals with media events, outside events, for example, today we had a flag raising, uh, just as one example, and many other responsibilities day to day, does research, helps with the legislature, uh, research bills and things like that. And we have the constituent services and culture affairs person, this is Cecilia. She helps, manages the constituent constituents who come in, which is fair, which is pretty frequent, uh, takes the takes and manages uh, responses to the phone calls, and she's and she's been in there only a short time, but she's involved with many cultural events, the Cultural Connections Committee, and uh, other boards and organizations around the city. Now, if anybody has any questions on any of that, uh, please say so. Otherwise, we will just go to the budget. Okay. Um, the budget uh, begins on, well, the, the explanation. Now, what, for, the, for the people who are new, what we tried to do last year was to provide more insight into the activities of each department. These written explanations 
were not there before last year. And we've had each department sort of try to outline for you and for the public some of their responsibilities. And we're hoping to, so I think this was a big step forward, but we are hoping to do more. But this year we focused on, instead of improving that, we focused on getting the budget to you earlier, which came, as you know, the first meeting in March, which was, I think, uh, six weeks earlier than last year and eight weeks earlier than the year before. In any event, so you see the written explanation. Uh, but the budget starts on page 71. It's up only 2%. Most of it is just payroll, uh, having to do with the, most of it is, it is payroll, all of it's payroll, all, the increase, having to do with the merit system changes we made. Uh, most of the other line items are really flat. Uh, you can see them. If you have any questions, I can answer that. Questions on the mayor's office? Oh, Alderman O'Brien. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I see in the uh, 52 account fringe benefits, and it's actually under the 52 300 benefits. Uh, I would imagine that's uh, part medical expenses, everything insurances, and everything else, and that's reflective of the jump that industry is demanding upon us, correct? Well, the, I think it reflects the fact that the, the 30%. Increase in the pension costs, the increase in the health and medical. Yes, I guess the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. The next part I wanted to, uh, I w I'm going to review with you is on page uh, 83, civic and community part of the civic and community activities budget. Um, if you look at account 55, other services, you will see the dues that we pay to uh, four different organizations: the municipal association here in New Hampshire, the regional solid waste district. That is a regional cooperative which runs hazardous waste pickups and some other waste-related activities. The National Regional Planning Commission, I'm, I suspect you're familiar with that, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And although I didn't add it, we as a city should consider the um, U.S. League of Cities. When I was mayor before, we were a member of the League of Cities and at one, a couple different times. In, in the Conference of Mayors, you really have to be the mayor to participate. But in the League of Cities, any city official can be involved. So a um, uh, couple of times, <laughs> some of the aldermen went down to the annual conference in Washington. And it was, you know, it's worthwhile. You just learn a lot and pick up some ideas and meet, a few, meet other people from similar communities. The dues would probably be similar. Their League of Cities is interested in getting Nash as a member. And they've been here to kind of press that point a little bit. Questions? Uh, um, well, I, oh, hang on. Yeah. And I think I'm supposed to cover also 56, which is the outside agencies. Um, <coughs> you can just see what they are. Um, there's the, of course, GAD. The only one that's up significantly is GAD, Great American Downtown. Uh, we are not giving them money for a concert this year <coughs> because they're trying to take over much of that themselves. We have done that in the past. But they, they're running so many activities, creating so many different things downtown that the budget that you see, I think, is the appropriate one. And uh, they are doing a really good job. <coughs> Excuse me. So any questions? On these community grants, those have already gone through a separate committee um, right, on the allocation of the amounts. No, the 56H, which is the human service agencies, those have all gone through. These others right. 
uh, those of all, That's what I meant. those all went to the C, the uh, the uh, uh, the new name. The new name, yes. What's the new name? I always think of the the uh, citizens advisory. I always think of it as review and comment. I started review and comment when I was mayor, so that's why it sticks with me. You ended it. What? You ended it. <laughs> and then we changed the name. Changed the name. Yeah. All right. You ready for questions? Yes. Uh, and all the Mintenza first. Can I just ask what other benefits the city receives or the city government receives from being part of U.S. Conference of Mayors or uh, U.S. League of Cities? I mean, are there databases that we would have access to uh, other than access to the um, – events that they put on or trainings? Well, they're resources. I don't know databases, but they're definitely resources. You know, you go there, you um, learn about a lot about what other cities are doing. You There's a lot of written material that you can get. Um, for example, the the uh, just one, one example is the U.S. Conference of Mayors produce a, a metro economic report, and it shows you nationwide what every metropolitan area in the United States what their gross product is, how that compares with others, what proportion of the state, uh, gross state product the metropolitan area produces. And as in this one little example, for example, uh, I know that Manchester, Nashua produce 35.1% of the state's gross product, New Hampshire's total economy, uh, which is an interesting and significant fact because it helps to boost the case for rail, for example. Um, but it's, that's just one thing. I mean, you, you know, you pick up ideas that you might pursue. Um, we have pursued ideas that I have learned at these various conferences. And, uh, you know, they say that, and this would also apply to members of the Board of Aldermen. <coughs> now, some, the, someone said that, um, you know, a mayor is a good thief or something like that because they steal ideas from the other ones. Uh, or borrow, maybe, is the answer, is the word. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's, you know, I think it's worthwhile for the very limited amount of expense that there is. You have a follow-up question? But just so you know, the revenues, if there were any revenues in any d division or department, will be in the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it would be listed under revenue. There's no revenue for that. Okay. And so my other question is, would they have um, those two resources Would if we had uh, similar to uh, what the uh, group from MIT is doing for us, uh, do they also provide services like, like that to do oversight or audits or is that? Uh, Not really, there? no. Okay. No. But like we're about to bring something to you pretty soon that's in development that uh, – I got the idea at, which it, which is not public yet. So, um, but it will be. And, uh, yeah. As soon as you uh, speak. Uh, and uh, so, you just pick up good ideas. Okay. I'll, I'll set. Yes, I thank you. And, and I think also you can sort of promote the community. I mean. Uh, the kind of the safe state. I've gone there to. They have, there's a drug task force which is chaired by Marty Walsh and um, the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, and presented on safe stations. I went to present. There's a group that uh, is involved with veterans homelessness, and after Nashua achieved functional zero for veteran homelessness, I, you know, I, of course, worked with Harbor Homes to who was uh, very involved in terms of, uh, and this was a 10-year effort, uh, just getting clear on all of the progress and how the whole thing had been accomplished, and I uh, reported to other cities about that. Um, Peter, I asked him to come, but he didn't really want to, so I did it. Uh, and it just, the this kind of exchange just, it, you know, has some has some value. All set? Yes, thank you. I have Alderman Lopez and Alderman O'Brien. I was just wondering, curious why the solid waste rate went up $4,000, whatever membership that is. It's just exactly their dues, it you know. This is what they charge us. 
Is it, is it worth it? I mean, well, they run a hazardous waste collection four times a year around the whole region, and they provide some other services re regarding waste disposal. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you have to make your own judgment on whether it's worth it. We could give you a presentation on more complete presentation on what that is and what they do. We could give you a written. Some, I'm just curious because it's a pretty big jump. So I mean, the yeah, total was was thirty. Yeah, it's a four thousand so, yeah, dollar jump. That's a big chunk of it. Yeah, I don't really like that, but I think it's. I don't really like it, but this is what they've all, come up with. All set. Yeah. All of Alderman O'Brien. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder if I could make a request for the chair to the mayor. <clears throat> if the mayor feels it is a good idea that we take a look at U.S. League of Cities, if he could uh, provide the uh, dollar amount, what would be our I can potential? get that. I can get that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, by the way, on uh, any queries we have for any of the meetings, it's in the minutes, and I'm keeping track. And, and uh, as we get information back, we'll present it to the entire board. Any other questions on, on this area? No? Okay, next is uh, Board of Aldermen. All right, I think I'm through, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I don't want to butt in on the Board of Aldermen, so <laughs> you have your own budget. I never get involved with that. And that would be Alderman McCarthy. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, expenses are on page 73. Uh, salaries went up a little bit. Everything else pretty much stayed the same. You'll note that we actually budgeted a little more for stenographic services because we actually spent more last year. We, um, we have had and not had an assistant in the office uh, several times. So when we don't have one, we, we um, contract out additional transcription services. Okay. Any questions on the Board of Aldermen? Yes, Alderman What's the Kelly. Current state of having an, an assistant. Do we have one now? What you said that when you we, don't have we one. We do at the moment. Okay. She yes. started a few weeks back. Okay. I met her today for the first time. She was deeply into listening to minutes and typing them out. <laughs> that that's probably good, right? Thank you. Did you have a question? No, Alderman Lopez. Alderman Lopez. Alderman Lopez appreciates the people who are copying down the minutes. Um, and I just wanted to <laughs> point out that this is definitely a cost-saving measure because we had, was that $1,000 we, extra we paid in stenographic services? Was that anticipated? Is there an, an, like a contingency fund for that? Seems like it's We transferred it out of the unexpended salary appropriations because we didn't have a transcriptionist working. So it wasn't, it wasn't exactly an expense then. All right. I'd still rather have an assistant who knows the job and the work and all that. All set. Any questions for any additional questions on the Board Alderman budget? Nobody questions stipends. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, legal department. Attorney Bolton. Thank you. Uh, that would be on... Begin page on page 75. 75. And as the mayor pointed out, we've got a little explanation of what we do, which is all the legal work on behalf of the city. <coughs> uh, and then the actual budget numbers start on page 77. The salaries and wages and the fringe benefits basically get filled in for me by the finance department. and. Uh, we actually have little control over that. So that's about $612,000 worth, and the other uh, fourteen dollars or $15,000 is uh, what I actually can, some of which I can actually try and do things about. Uh, but mostly it's estimating what the expense will be of things that uh, we essentially have to do. Uh, we've got three lawyers, and we have our dues and fees to uh, the Supreme Court and the Bar Association. Uh, the travel line is essentially just for the mileage when we have to go out of town for uh, 
Typically, it's something in Manchester or Concord. We don't go much further than that. Uh, we were required to get a certain amount of legal education, 12 hours a year, and uh, that's what the training and certification line is for. Uh, brought that down a little bit uh, based upon our experience this year and hoping for the best. Uh, Litigation-related expenses is very difficult to predict. We came out short last year, so I increased it some this year. Uh, very modest increase in postage for the same reason, but I've come down a little bit in the uh, filing and recording fees. Again, based on it seemed like we'd be a little, little uh, less need there. We're certainly using email and other resources to reduce postage. And then I've just juggled things around a little bit with uh, office supplies and uh, publication expenses. Uh, we get periodicals. We have to update the uh, books we have. Uh, you get supplements and pocket parts every year because the legislature keeps improving our laws each year. And uh, so there's more law there to uh, purchase and refer to. So the upshot is that uh, we're about $1,000 more than last year on basically these miscellaneous items. Uh, I do have some understanding of why the salaries and the fringe benefits go up. But as I said, I really have no control, but I can try and answer any questions that you might have in those areas as well. Questions are legal. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, nope. you got one. Nope. Uh, you're not off the hot seat yet here, Attorney <laughs> So I, I know that, um, this past year uh, was busy for your office as far as litigation is concerned. And I'm wondering how the staffing levels, uh, well, how were the staffing levels uh, with, with that level? And um, is it something, could you use another person in the office? We could definitely use another lawyer. Okay. Um, we're... We're making do, and a lot of us are putting in extra time. Uh, it's not a 40-hour-a-week job. It, uh, it takes more than that. Uh, but we are making do. Could we do more? Yes, I think we could provide uh, quicker turnover in some of the inquiries from the different departments and divisions. Uh, we've got some fairly large projects that we're making progress on, but it would go much quicker. Uh, I think we could do more in the way of code enforcement and uh, initiating legal action to prevent some of the things that uh, may violate some of our codes and ordinances uh, if we had someone else to pursue those. Uh, primary thing is uh, the, uh, well, there's a sign on Amherst Street that we uh, hear a lot about. <laughs> if I had someone else, I might put them to work on that. So, yes, if you want to appropriate sufficient additional funds, we would like to hire another <laughs> lawyer. But this year didn't seem like the year to ask for that. If I may, Mr. Chairman, yes. just follow up. So have you had to um, hire out? Uh, outside counsel more because of that, because of this year? We've actually been trying to reduce our reliance on outside counsel. Now, as you know, we're doing a revaluation this year. When you do a revaluation, people notice that the assessed value of their property has changed. Uh, that's true for individual homeowners, but it's even more true of uh, larger enterprises, commercial and industrial uh, property owners. The year, first year or two after a citywide evaluation, you can expect to get more abatement requests and then appeals either to court or the Board of Tax and Land Appeals uh, challenging what our determination is as to 
the assessed value of particular properties. Uh, f four years ago, before I was uh, here, or yeah, when I was when someone else was occupying this seat, uh, there was some more hiring out of attorneys to handle some of those abatements for us. Uh, in the last few years of this five-year cycle, you tend to have resolved these values, and they get carried through for the remainder of the five-year cycle. So the last two years, uh, any abatements we've handled, either the assessing department or in the legal department, we've, uh, we've done that ourselves without resorting to hiring outside counsel. Now, you often have to hire outside experts to do appraisals, and we've done that. I would like to think that we can avoid that next year. The year after that, we will be very busy with the tax cases. Um, and it will be primarily uh, Deputy Corporation Counsel Leonard and I who do those. Uh, Deputy Clark will handle other aspects of uh, the work in the office. Uh, and if we were at that point to bring in someone new and add a fourth lawyer to the staff, we would probably start them off doing some some other tasks that were not high-level litigation. Um, so you may be hearing more on that subject next year. Uh, but it is one of my goals to reduce our reliance on outside counsel to uh, develop the expertise in-house, because we get a much better bang for the buck that way. If I, if I was just going to follow up with, could you give us a sense of uh, what your hourly rate would be versus what private counsel's hourly rate would be, even on tax abatement cases? Well, 300 an hour. For private counsel? Yeah. Uh, we've got the bridge case, the bridge that's uh, part of the Broad Street Parkway project. Uh, we've got the Wadley firm in the uh, persons of uh, attorney uh, Frank Spinella and attorney Steve Bennett uh, working on that for us. And uh, Celia Leonard and I are overseeing all of that uh, along with the outside firm. but. 300 an hour is what attorney Spinella is charging us, and it's a little less for attorney Bennett. But sometimes we have both of them at once, which you're approaching $600 an hour at that point. So the more you can do in-house, the better off we're going to be. Now, that that is a particularly uh, high-stakes proposition, and the decision to hire outside counsel was made before I occupy this position, but I think that decision was a good one when it was made. Um, these people, Attorney Spinella particularly is one of the uh, primary construction law attorneys in the state, and uh, he is dedicating a substantial portion of his time, somewhat unfortunately, uh, building-wise, but we know we're getting uh, good representation out of it. And the case is progressing well for us thus far, so I'm happy about that. All set, Alderman Kenzie? Yes, thank you. Alderman Kelly? Yeah, I actually just, it was more of a curious thing about um, line item under the 53, the $1. What is that? Yeah, that's a quirk of the financing situation. Um, if you have an account with a dollar in it, you can transfer money into it. It is more complicated if you uh, do not have an account in existence if you're trying to get money for a needed purpose. So it's really in there as a placeholder. Thank you. Other questions? Alderman Lopez. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a lawyer level role, but is the legal department, is there a role for reviewing how committees function and um, operate? Because there's some committees right now that I'm not entirely sure they have training on the legal concerns, um, the way they communicate maybe through email where there might be 
you know, it would be good to get ahead of that and train people on right to know laws and that kind of thing. Um, and then additionally, uh, there's been several times where as aldermen, I've heard public comment that certain minutes weren't available from a committee or couldn't be found. So those kind of seem like things where legal action might eventually be taken if we're not monitoring it. So legal department might want to be involved, but it's not necessarily a role where you need a full lawyer. Yeah. We don't actually monitor compliance. I oh, have more like training. the department has generated some memoranda on general overviews of uh, public bodies' responsibilities uh, under RSA 91A, what's often called the right to know law. Um, and we try and get that distributed to all the various boards, commissions, committees, and, and so forth. Uh, we further done some on specific issues that arise under the right to know law. Uh, one I can think of offhand is the use of uh, emails, text messages, and other electronic communications, which can be interpreted as circumventing the open meeting requirements of the law. Uh, if you have, uh, and, and this board has heard my spiel on this before too, but if you have a whole series of emails among a majority of a body, uh, basically you end up with what really resembles discussion and decision, part of the decision making process being done outside the public eye. And there's a specific provision in the statute about not using these beans to circumvent the intent and spirit of the law. And that has been interpreted to prohibit uh, these emails. And Town of Sandwich had a decision against it to the tune of $200,000, which was a significant hit to that town's budget. And uh, we would like to avoid something on that scale. Uh, so while we don't monitor, and, and we really can't, we don't, we don't have the ability to uh, monitor every meeting of every committee, commission, or the like to see if they got their minutes done on time, if they took adequate minutes, if uh, someone's been sending emails around when they shouldn't have, whether the proper postings uh, were done. Uh, 24 hours in advance in two public places, one of which can be on the city's website. Uh, when it's called to our attention, we try and remind people of what the obligations are under the law. But we don't uh, further, if asked, we would, but we don't further delve into uh, monitoring of whether com committees, commissions, and the like have outlived their usefulness or uh, have not met for a period of time and therefore ought to be considered for uh, dissolution or the like. Uh, that's not, as I say, if we were ever asked to do that in specific cases, we could undertake it, but we've not been generally charged with doing that. I'll start Alderman Lopez. Yeah, makes sense. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next is the city clerk's office. The revenues are on page 32 and the appropriations are on page 79. Good evening. Everyone, how are you today? So, um, you Can guys you did just identify yourself for the first sure, um, Patricia Piazzu, the city clerk. So, um, you guys did receive a PowerPoint presentation, and then I also gave you tonight um, additional information on the budget. So, in my office is myself, so the city clerk. We have Judy Bolo, who's the deputy city clerk. Deanne Harris is the department coordinator. We do have three vital records clerks. One of those positions is currently vacant. 
And I will have another vacancy at the end of the month as I have an individual who will be retiring in our office. Um, we have two different email addresses within our office. We have our regular email, the city clerk department, and we establish one just for our dogs so it wouldn't get buried in our city clerk. So we have the Nashville dogs email, so, which has worked out very, very well. So um, whatever the items that we do in our office, a lot is vital records administration. So where the issuing of the birth, marriages, deaths, and divorce. Um, and believe it or not, divorce, even though it happens countywide, we have access to it. State of New Hampshire did this huge project where they put in over a million records. So we can go back for births back to 1935, except for if you were born in the years 49 and 50. We don't have those in the system. Um, we can key them in, but because they were leather bound, they didn't want to take them out when they did the project. Um, and birth, uh, marriage and death go back in the 60s, 65 I think it is. Um, so that we can issue those records whether they were married here, I should say applied here, or if they applied in uh, North Conway, Concord, Manchester, those records are available at any senior town clerk's office. We also do delayed certificates of birth, marriage, and death. So if somebody, for a reason, didn't file their marriage, or didn't file the birth certificate after six months, we would also process those. We do our marriage licenses. Um, we do corrections on certificates, affidavits of paternity. So if there's not a father on a record, that's one way to add a father to a record. Uh, the other way is a legitimation. Uh, we also do adoptions and court orders. And we also will start, again, performing ceremonies now that we have another JP in the office as well. So and those ceremonies happen to be right here in the chamber. So, And that is a picture of our vault up there with some of the vital records. That's some of our birth volumes in our vault. Licensing. So, yeah, licensing. We're right now into our main licensing season. March, April, and May is our busiest time for licensing. Dogs, we do both the new, renewal, remo we remove them, and then, of course, we go into the civil forfeiture mode come June and July. We do pawnbrokers and secondhand dealers, amusement devices and those that have billiard tables, taxi cab and chauffeur's licenses, overnight parking permits, raffle permits, vendor permits, anybody that has a parade show or a carnival walkathon, and then special events like the mayor said, Great American Downtown has done a lot of things and they really qualify under our special events with the holiday stroll, the taste, the farmer's market. Those are much more involved and involve basically a lot of the city departments sometimes will have <laughs> special meetings so that all the departments are all there on the same wavelength so we all know what's going on with these events. Elections. Uh, well, city clerk is the chief election official, so I oversee all the moderators, ward clerks, and selectmen, besides the ballot inspectors and deputy registrars. So depending on the type of election, I could train up to 200 election officials for an election. Um, we're definitely responsible for that, making sure that integrity of that election. That is very, very fun. And as we all know, the laws have become more complex as it comes to elections and everything and is registering to vote. Um, but we make sure that we are staying to that letter of the law. We also work with the Public Works Department, Park and Rec, and the School Department for the setting up and taking down the polls. And of course, we do the registration here in our office, all the ad additions, the changes for those individuals that passed away, that moved out of the city, or if candidates do mailings and they send, bring me in um, the candidate mailings because they've become a return to sender, we also follow up on that information and send a voter a 30-day letter. Records management, uh, as the city clerk, the clerk is the clerk for the Board of Aldermen. We're also responsible for recording the resolution and all the ordinances. Uh, we perform certificate of votes and authorities, a, a certificate of authority of a resolution or an ordinance. We do the codification and publication of the ordinances and records management. So that which you see in there, again, is a part of our vault. That's part of our older records that are in there. Um, so we preserve our records in accordance with the state law and city ordinances. Whoops. So some, sorry, some additional responsibilities. Um, we also handle poll licenses. 
So we work with the Board of Public Works on that. We submit the information, they approve it. Um, so if Eversource wants to put a poll up or anything like that, we handle that through our office. The street acceptances and discontinuance, a wetlands application, any hospital liens, articles of incorporation. We do do the boards and commissions in our office. We do the justice of the peace and notary uh, services and any other duties that may get assigned to us <laughs> in the state law, city charter, and local ordinances. And one of those things just came into play a few years ago where we have to record those individuals that um, owners that have more than four apartment dwellings and everything, the landlord tenant, we have to file, those have to be filed in our office. So we maintain those in our office. So our overall budget. Our overall budget. Now, last year when I came before this board, I was able to give you back $47,000 because we went from basically two elections to one election and everything, like three elections to one election. Unfortunately, this year I'm going up elections, so I'm looking at, unfortunately, over the 2%. Um, so we do have up here the FY18 original budget. The benefits, again, as you've heard from the other individuals, is something... I have no control under over, um, but um, I am up and need an additional $10,840 over the 2% that um, was requested through the mayor and everything like that because of the state and federal election. So if you'd like, from, if there's no questions on that, we can go into the revenue part of it, which starts on page 32. I do have a question. Can you tell us what the last election cost? Yes. The special election um, was twenty. Ended up costing twenty eight thousand one hundred and forty dollars. I had requested 3410. We did have um, the police department came in a little lower, um, but we had a very difficult time finding election workers for this election because a lot of them had gone away. And then we ended up having some call in sick on election day. Further, I think I liked the process many years ago when the board got to make the decision. Actually, that's one of my first experiences was on this board was um, that the Board of Aldermen, uh, move, uh, I guess one of the aldermen at large left, and one of the ward aldermen moved up to the at-large seat, which left the Ward 7 seat open. So the Board of Aldermen voted on two candidates, myself and, and another, uh, Paul Chassie, who ended up being elected to fill the term of the ward aldermen. You know, having a special election for $28,000 with an abysmal turnout, just, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, like you said, especially having a difficult time getting ward workers and, and such a long day. I think our ward had 89 voters, Ward 4. I mean, for people to be there for 14, 14 plus hours mm -hmm. for that low a turnout just doesn't make sense to me. But great work anyway on your thank part, you. so thank you for that. What was the total number of voters that voted on? I think it was 3,119. Okay. Alderman Moran and then Alderman Lopez. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask the clerk <clears throat> basically what uh, Alderman Wilshire was saying, and I think for the, for the people at home, can you just give us a brief overview? I know at one time the board could have the power to appoint or elect somebody to come in in a midterm vacancy forever was the case, but that was changed by, uh, you know, could you just go over that part and how we are bound currently now by law that maybe we should probably take a peek at, but that's a subject for a different date. I don't have the year because it, it didn't happen while I was here. I've been here for the past 10 years, but it was a charter amendment that went before the voters that was approved by the voters to change the charter to from what it was where they did that, where they had somebody appoint, to now having the special election, depending on whether it's before, within six months or more than six months in a day. So it basically uh, turned out to be like $10 per vote. Alderman Lopez. 
Um, just for clarification, you mean six months of the end of their term? Six months and a day left of a term. Okay, I was because my question was actually going to be, we did have a, an alderman step down and we did just appoint the next one. So I was kind of confused why we couldn't have done that here. So now I understand that if somebody basically leaves before six months of the end of the ter their term, then we have to have the whole election and That's the correct. associated expenses, which in this case we're not we're not very good like and i don't i don't think even the public really endorsed the concept because nobody showed up to vote for it so i think it is definitely something we need to look at uh, yes alderman kelly Thank you. i was wondering if we know historically how many special elections we've had at least in your time here and and how this compares to previous ones well, the difficulty, I don't know it off the top of my head, but some of the special elections may be tied into with regular elections. We had that in Ward 8, where we had a special election, but it was tied into another election. So if, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I want to say there's probably been three or four, but this is the lowest since I have been here. I'm sorry, just follow on. When you say lowest, you mean the lowest? Lowest turnout. Turnout, thank you. Alderman McCarthy, could you change that? section of the charter, we've only had two special elections under that. One was the alderman at large, and the second one was this Board of Ed race. And in both cases, the turnout was abysmally low. Mm -hmm. Alderman Lopez? I just wanted to observe that maybe the proximity to the beginning of a term might have had something to do with it. I think the public might have been like, we just did all the elections, and now there's another one. So maybe a middle of the road solution might be a charter amendment that instead of saying all all people who you know are who leave their office the alderman can appoint maybe saying if they leave their office within like 6 months of another election then the alderman can appoint it and then you can just piggyback them on the next election feel free to work with legal to draft that charter amendment well, they need another lawyer, so. McCarthy? What it provides for now is if they leave within six months, the position just stays vacant. So it would not affect, I mean, I, I, frankly, I think from what we've seen, it may be just as effective to go back to the old way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kelly. If that was the case, it, the, does the charter amendment have to go back to the public like the previous one was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the okay and if that was the case then if depending on when that was brought forward it could be held possibly with the election this fall or with the election next year thank you or we could have a special election for or we could have stay away from that i'm sure to stay in the I budget or somewhere near it that. i knew she was biting her tongue playing. on that one <laughs> Any other questions for the city clerk? Yeah. Alderman McCarthy. So the weddings that are taking place in the chamber mm -hmm. are are administered by the clerk's office and the revenue is going to the clerk's office, is that correct? That's correct, it's part of the general fund, yeah. Thank you. Yes, Alderman Lopez. So I noticed that weddings are down and dog ownership is up, so I'm a little worried about that trend. <laughs> but I also noticed that the cab companies dropped by half because I think that was uh, Nashua Taxi closed. That is correct. So if you'd like, I, that's a great, I think, preview into going into the revenue budget. So um, I just gave you some line items. Um, basically, our, my line request still is over from what my FY18 request. Our fee for certified records are $15 for the first and 10 for the second. But again, we have to give the state money for that. Um, so they receive $8 for each first copy and $5 for every second copy. The good thing is that money comes back into the cities and towns. Um, they're the one that program helped put that million dollar records in. I happen to serve as the chair of that fund, Vital Records Improvement Fund Committee. Uh, the marriage license fee is $50. We have to give the state 43 of that. It goes into a domestic violence grant program. So we get $7 for every marriage. So I think of my, um, those marriages are going down though. We haven't, we're not seeing as many people get married. Um, dog licenses, we have to send the state $2 for each dog license we do, except for those senior, those in owners that are seniors there for $3. But then we also have to give $50 for each dog for the veterinary diagnostic lab fees. The financial statement recordings, which we used to, what we used to call them UCCs, universal, universal, 
uniform commercial code is monies that are received by the state that goes into the Secretary of State and they give us money quarterly. They're not good at giving us our money at times. Um, they're getting a little better because I keep calling them. I think you said $50. I think you meant 50 cents, right? 50 cents. Oh, yeah, 50 cents for each dog, yeah. Just so the transcriptionist doesn't... Yeah, 50 cents. Put that the transcriptionist does a great job. Uh, and then the voter checklist, yes, we do sell some of them here within our office, but the bulk of it is through the Secretary of State, um, whereas the um, parties can go there and get it, but they in turn have to send the monies to the locals. So if you look at the um, FY19 budget for revenue, which is on page 32... Our vendor licenses are definitely declined. We're not doing, we're not seeing as many hot dog and ice cream vendors coming out and everything like we used to have. Um, there, there's a lot less of those. Um, for the amusement devices, we, we dro I've dropped it $700 because we've lost some businesses. And as you stated, we did lose Nashua Taxi. We also lost a <coughs> one-person taxi company as well um, that went out of business. Uh, for the marriage licenses, we uh, dropped it 500 for the decline in the number of people, and I did um, ask the state for numbers, and we have seen a decline over last year to this year. I did increase the dogs some, but because we have to give the state so much money. Right now, we have licensed 2,962 dogs, and we still have uh, over 8,000 dogs to license for this year. So if the public slaves listening, you want to come in and license your dog. <laughs> Um, financing statement reports, I'm bringing that up because the fact is, like I said, I've been working with the Secretary of State's office to make sure they are reporting the fees that we're receiving them when we should be receiving them. Certified copies, I, of course, I increased that $3,000 where we get those a million records added to the database. We're finding more people coming here. We've been doing a lot of things from like Lebanon, Conway, Concord. Pelham even coming into our office, even people that are coming from Hollis and stuff like that are coming into our office. But then a lot of them also work down here, so it's much easier to come to us because we have longer hours than some of the towns do. Um, and then civil forfeitures, I raise because we have a lot of people that are not licensing their dogs in a timely manner, so of course, and we're issuing those civil forfeiture fines. Questions? On the so the the cab the chauffeur's licenses those are background checks and confirmation that a person is I guess safe to drive a cab and then maybe business licenses the sh the, the sh taxi and chauffeur license the taxi is the taxi cabs it costs seventy five dollars per cab to have on the road and then the chauffeur license is fifty two dollars the um, background checks and everything like that comes out of my expense budget. So this is just the revenue for re uh, doing the cars and to license the chauffeurs. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out it, where the revenue was being generated out of in terms of service. So the question I was kind of heading towards is, with Lyft and Uber apparently taking the role of cabs in automobile transportation, do we have any opportunity for generating revenue from those or should we consider? Like, is there any burden on the city? having Uber and Lyft drivers, are they doing all the work that we would normally have to do? We have no control over that. When the law passed, when the legislature passed that law, um, that's all handled by the State Department of Transportation. So the, we can't have a Uber, Uber driver or a Lyft driver be licensed in the city any longer. Previously, we tried that, but since this law came into effect, we can't do that. Okay. Uh, Alderman Kelly. Um, I want to talk about parking, everyone's favorite subject. I was wondering, it looks like the revenues are about the same as last year. Do you anticipate an increase with the new parking app and making it a little bit easier for people to pay their fees? For the over, the only overnight, <coughs> the passes are the overnight parking, and I didn't really increase it because we have any, we just, we may have just hit 300 passes now from June, from July 1st to present. Uh, we only see an upsurge in people coming in for overnight parking passes when parking enforcement has gone out and given them tickets. We have a quite a long list of people that are looking for parking passes that are not on the program, and we are continuing to monitor that and have that. So should the Committee of Infrastructure wish that information, like we did last year, we have that list available. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if your question was in 
about meters because I realized parking, that uh, parking that's... meters it'll stay the same because anything over that amount goes to the downtown yeah. improvements committee. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, now, I only deal with overnight parking permits. Great. Couple, Thank you. And we will have parking come in under a separate budget. Yes, it actually shows up as parking revenue. We have a different appropriation that pays for the downtown improvements committee because the parking revenue cannot directly go to that. It has to go to transportation related expenses. Right. Okay. Um, when people get a, a CD of the list of voters, where does that revenue show up in the miscellaneous? Um, it shows. Okay, I get my revenue. Yes, it does. Okay. The other question, since we have two casinos in Nashville now, do we license any of the machines they use? Or is the state picking up on that revenue? State. <laughs> we only had a legislator here. Anyway. Exactly, casino. <laughs> okay, any other questions for the city clerk? All right. All right. Thank you very much. So, on the operating side now for the expense budget. So, as you've heard, salaries we don't have much control over, but I am increasing the overtime budget, um, additional $1,500 due to the second state election. Um, and then, of course, the wages elected and appointed officials are going to be going up due to the fact that we have that second election as well. Um, election services are up 14, almost $15,000. Um, as you know, um, when we came in for the police department for the special election, I'm looking at almost a $9,500 bill for the police because the fact is we're hiring these officers at an overtime rate, not at a special detail rate, so that this way we know that we do have officers in the polling locations. If it was at a extra detail rate, um, that means that if an officer didn't take it, I wouldn't have any coverage in some of the polling locations. And with all the polling locations being schools, it's very imperative that we make sure the safety of the students are there for the, especially for September. Yes, November, there is no school, there should be no school in November, but again, it's just to make sure that people are not wandering in the school. Um, on, on that vein, real quick, I noticed around town many times that when there are traffic uh, details, uh, police traffic details for paving or whatever, <coughs> They're from other cities. You, if we don't have enough national police to volunteer for the overtime, can you hire from Milford, Hollis, Merrimack? What uh, in t in talking with Chief Lavoy and everything like this, what they do is if for the schools like this for this, that I know they would force overtime. Okay. For this, because it's that's why we're doing it the overtime, not an extra detail rate. Because the extra detail rate, they have a third company pay for it now, the way they do the billing. Okay. Um, also included in that additional 14000 cost is, of course, the ballot programming of the machines. So this year, we're going to have a third ballot for the primary because the Libertarian Party in 2016 garnered the 4% necessary. So we'll have a Republican, Democrat, and Libertarian Party. And then, of course, in November, that will also cause an additional um, party column ballot. Um, that it will cost, of course, additional extra for the programming of the ballots and everything. And, of course, the extra delivery of the ward workers or the materials or them coming in to pick up their stuff. I am looking for an additional $500 in um, book restoration for our old volumes. I just had um, 1884 and 18, through 1887 records bound. So this will bring it up to where I'll be able to do possibly a couple books again next year. These are books that we do go into. These are our records um, that, believe it or not, we have people come in and to do genealogy, and we need to really keep these books in good shape. Um, mileage reimbursements, I additional, add, put additional 200. Of course, the cost of mileage has gone up some, but um, been up to Concord a few times to testify. Uh, but also we have new staff and the training and everything like that. The big change is that we had conference and seminars under 54400, and I changed that to, in talking with um, financial services, to 5421, which is employee training and certifications, because that's exactly what we do. When we go to the conferences, it's for either to keep our certifications, whether it's our New Hampshire certifications up, 
or for me, my national, my international certification up and everything like that. That's what these conference and trainings are, is for the certifications of the staff. Printing, I reduced $5,100 due to the fact that we no longer have the printing of the ballots, but I also be able to reduce it because of the printing of our envelopes. When we went out this time, we were able to get a cheaper rate. Um, now that we don't have a print shop in-house anymore, we have to go out, but uh, they were able to get a good deal. And when you're ordering 15,000 envelopes, you can get a really good deal. Um, so I was able to drop that information, that money, and then I was able to drop postage delivery $2,300 because we are sending more dogs through the through email. As a matter of fact, we've been collecting even e more email addresses for dogs, and that's how we send out the renewal notices. But I've also changed the way we do the civil forfeiture mailing, so we're saving some money there. Other contracted services, um, I removed 5,500 of that. 5,950 was for inauguration. Um, pay, um, monies, so that has been removed from the budget. But the other money I've removed out is for the drug testing for the chauffeur drug, because the fact is, whereas we lost Nash for taxi, I'm not, we're not gonna have that many people being tested now, um, that we have the random test, there's the pre-employment test and the random test. So I was able to drop that money. Miscellaneous supplies was an additional $200, um, again, towards the elections and everything, and the $100 for publications. Um, I think I have $2 left in that budget right now um, due to the fact that we've got a lot of law books because there's been so many law changes, and I see that coming down the pike again this year. So we, as Corporation Counsel Steve Bolton stated, um, we have to keep our books up to date. and. There's been a lot of changes in the laws that are coming down our pike. So be happy to answer any questions on my expense budget. Owen O'Brien. <clears throat> yes, if we could step back to uh, election services. Um, I heard you say we're going to a third party system, okay? And that is because of the registered voters within the Libertarian Party. Is that what's motivating that? No, the Libertarian Party is now a party that's been distinguished by the legislature because the fact is they received 4% of the vote in 2016. So now in the, st in the state, we have a Republican, Democrat, and Libertarian Party. So they have a right to have a ballot as well. So there will be three ballots, one for each one. Whether there'll be candidates on the ballot, that whereas it's a state election, it'll be up to them. As you know, we have pink for Republican, blue for Democrat. I'm not sure what they're going to do for the Libertarian ballot. Yes, that's, in essence, a follow-up, if I may, Mrs. Mm -hmm. That, in yes. essence, is what I'm getting to, because I don't know. May, we might end up under the 4% or whatever it is, the state requirement in the city of Nashville, and it might, like you say, just be vacant in a lot of cases. Correct. Or it it, it be could both. be. Again, where this is state and federal offices, you're correct. There may be nobody running on the libertarian side, but what will come with that ballot comes out in September, there could be a lot of write-ins. Um, one thing I heard from a lot of people is they said they didn't know there was a special election. And that's why they didn't go out and vote. Is there any way we can use the code red system or, or the other phones? And we can we notify everybody if a school's been canceled, but you'd think we could notify them that there's an election the next day, or is, do you know if they can use that for that? I know that we did have it on our Facebook, and I tried to get the Telegraph to put things in. I know that I did the same thing with the filing period when I wasn't sure what somebody was going to file and everything. So, um, but yeah, I can talk with Justin to see if that's something that we can do as far as the code red or even another. I know there's a new alert system because I'm getting a new Texas signed up for it. Maybe there's something with even within our website that we can do something with so that it'll alert people. But I know it was on. I made sure it was on the home page and tried to stay up on the main item. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next item is emergency management. Speaking of Justin, <laughs> and the appropriations are on page one sixty one. Do, uh, I don't know if you guys have a copy of the slide deck or... We do, or I do. 
it's on the doors, right? But then we'll see in here. Let's see if they put it in here. Uh, well, let me pull it up real quick. I know it's on. I know it's in the agenda. Come on. I think a lot of people didn't print it out because there were a lot of pages in that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm Justin Cates, uh, City's Emergency Management Director. Um, so uh, uh, I, I believe the memo said pictures are worth a thousand words, so I put lots of pictures in uh, <laughs> yes, to kind of discuss what our office does and, and give, paint a little bit of a picture as to uh, what our responsibilities are within the city. Uh, so for, for those of you that I've worked with, you're, you're familiar with emergency management and, and what it does here within Nashua. Uh, but for those that um, are new to the board, uh, I, I really want to emphasize the importance of um, comprehensive emergency management. Uh, emergency management uh, is not just about uh, reacting to emergencies. It's really about being proactive and trying to work with community organizations, city departments uh, related to emergency planning. Uh, so we use this concept, con comprehensive emergency management, uh, all phases. So that includes mitigation, which is the reduction of risk in the community, preparedness, which is preparing our citizens, businesses, nonprofits, city departments, uh, response, which is what we typically see on the news um, after some sort of a major incident, and then long-term recovery, uh, which is uh, an area that we'll typically end up dealing with if we have some sort of a disaster declaration where we have to do uh, financial reimbursement uh, from FEMA. Uh, but certainly during a catastrophic disaster would include uh, reconstruction of uh, areas that have been devastated by the uh, emergency. Uh, all actors, so uh, emergency is not just, or emergency management is not just a, a government function. It really relies on uh, involvement from everybody ranging from the businesses in the community uh, to nonprofits that provide services and support day to day. Uh, all the way ranging down to citizens, um, which are, are critical to making sure that we're a prepared community. Uh, and then all hazards and threats, and this is one of the largest challenges that we that we deal with in emergency management is um, the fact that uh, there's a, a specific hazard that's of concern on the news, and what will end up happening is we focus all of our efforts and time on that hazard. So as an example, right now, uh, there's a, a significant amount of concern about active shooters uh, and what type of emergency planning is involved in that. Uh, I always ask people to step back and look at how we can plan for all types of emergencies, particularly along the lines of things that are commonplace across all types of emergencies. As an example, we may have a circumstance where we need to notify people of an active shooter event, which works for tornadoes and fires and all the other types of emergencies. So why not develop a good communications plan rather than having specific plans for the hundreds uh, of different hazards that can impact our community at any one time? Um, we, like many organizations, um, map our activities based on uh, a standard, uh, and this is the emergency management standard. Uh, this is uh, the Emergency Management uh, Accreditation Program. Uh, the City of Nashua is not accredited uh, in emergency management uh, because there are, are, are gaps that we have within our emergency planning uh, that uh, require additional resources, and I'll, I'll highlight some of those, those areas. Uh, but this is just a, a brief overview of, of some of the different activities that an emergency management organization, ranging from a local government through the state government all the way to a, uh, a, the federal emergency management agency should be doing uh, uh, based on their jurisdictional responsibilities. 
So first, uh, hazard identification, risk assessment, and consequence analysis, uh, a significant portion of our preparedness work is looking to see uh, areas within the community that are vulnerable to different types of disasters. Uh, we also do a lot of individualized assessments. Uh, one, of the, one of the most uh, predominant activities that we're involved in right now is we'll go to uh, facilities, uh, everything ranging from schools, child cares, churches, businesses, and assist them in the development of an emergency plan. And really the first step in that is to do an assessment of their facility, look at identified uh, vulnerabilities for their facilities and how they may be uh, more at risk for some sort of a hazard in comparison to others. Uh, so this has been a, a very popular program of ours and we've been doing quite a bit of it uh, recently. Hazard mitigation, so this is the reduction of risk in the community. Um, some of the examples of this uh, uh, are more focused along construction projects, hard construction projects, where uh, we can try and um, build stronger so that we don't experience damages and devastation after some sort of an event. Uh, one of the better examples of this in Nashua is, if you've ever looked at the um, the inflatable crest gate on the Jackson Falls Dam, that's an example of a mitigation project where it's enabled a number of properties to get out of the floodplain uh, and re reduce their risk of flooding along the Nashua River. So it's those types of initiatives uh, that prevent us from having to go into the response and recovery phases. The challenge with this is this is the most expensive part um, because it's, it involves, in most cases, significant investments, capital improvements. Prevention. Um, Prevention is typically uh, used along the lines of um, human cause hazards. So this would be uh, ranging from um, an active shooter event to um, some sort of uh, adversarial type attack against a piece of critical infrastructure or one of our community organizations. There's been a lot of attention on this uh, related to the schools over the past couple of years. Um, our school department has uh, a full-time staff person who is responsible for safety and security uh, and does have the resources to ensure that our public schools are, are really in good shape related to uh, security, physical security measures in the schools. Uh, that is not the same case for the private schools, the faith-based schools, and all the child care centers that we deal with in the city. Uh, so that falls back on our, our office to provide assistance in recommendations. Um, and trying to balance the impacts between Fire and Life Safety Code, which wants to get people out of buildings, versus recommendations for physical security, which are trying to lock people into buildings. So we have to um, ensure that we're meeting all the requirements uh, for both the, uh, the the laws that impact those types of facilities and any uh, rules that they might have. A good example of that is child care. Child care has specific <coughs> rules as to require access for parents and guardians to be able to access their children at any time within the building, which goes against the concept of securing the building. So we have to help organizations to, to meet all those requirements and, and try and, and balance them out across the board. And this also goes not just schools and child cares, but really any piece of um, uh, <laughs> municipal infrastructure, private sector infrastructure that's really important uh, to our society. Operational planning and procedures, um, so this ranges from uh, the city's comprehensive emergency plan, which is sort of the Bible for emergency management uh, within the city. This is something that we update every five years, and uh, the purpose of this is to identify the responsibilities, the roles of municipal departments during an emergency situation. Uh, every community uh, is required to have one if they are going to receive federal funding for emergency management programs. Um, but there are also specialized plans that we will work on throughout the year. Um, one example is the uh, active threat standard operating procedures that we've developed in conjunction with fire, EMS, and, and police in the city. Uh, we've dedicated a lot of time on that because that's certainly a concern to most people is active shooters and active threat incidents. Um, so what we ended up doing as part of that is convening a group of uh, stakeholders from each of those departments to develop a way that we would be able to respond together and work in conjunction with each other rather than against each other. Um, so in many cases, it'll be the development of specialized plans that we'll work on throughout the year. Um, uh, we also, uh, it's a good time to mention this here, is we're a storm-ready accredited community. So what that means is the National Weather Service has identified Nashua as a location that has developed emergency plans for uh, natural hazards, so severe weather events, uh, to be able to notify the public, uh, take action, and ensure that uh, people that are within our public facilities are notified of an emergency. 
operational planning and procedures, uh, I did mention the comprehensive emergency management plan, which is a requirement. Every community has to have an emergency operations plan. Um, the other thing that's, re that's, that's required to meet accreditation, as we had, had discussed, is uh, a recovery plan, and we're currently working through that, and I'll explain that initiative uh, in a couple more slides. There are two plans that we do not have in the city um, and that uh, you know, I, I believe are, are a pretty significant gap. Uh, which is the continuity of operations plan and the continuity of government plan. And what those are, continuity of operations, unlike an emergency plan, is how do you maintain your services in the event of an emergency? Um, so it's easy for us to just say, are oh, we're going to shut down, we're going to get everybody to safety here at City Hall, but how do we maintain the critical services that we provide to the community? If we had a fire here in the automatic chambers, <coughs> what would we do instead? Um, continuity of government uh, focuses much more in line with uh, lines of secession. So there is some information in our uh, charter about uh, the line of secession for the mayor. But beyond that, that's about it. So um, in most um, large uh, municipalities, uh, and particularly at the state level, they'll de develop lines of secession for every city department as to who's capable of making decisions if somebody was um, pulled out of service for some reason. Uh, so that's an area where um, the accreditation requires that, and, and we unfortunately do not have that uh, that set up yet. We have it, a special election, though, right? We can have a special election if we need to. Hmm. Well, and I'll give you a good example of continuity of operations. Um, so one of the things that's been in the news quite a bit uh, that uh, City Clerk uh, has been involved with is is the cancellation <laughs> of um, elections due to snowstorms, and. I've worked with uh, Trish to, to come up with some thoughts on how we might be able to relocate an election site if we weren't able to use it for some reason. Uh, what would we do if there was an incident at an election site? Um, but it really requires yeah. us to develop a, a plan as to what are the essential functions that we're required to, required to provide via the law and how can we go about dealing with those things in an alternative manner that meets the requirements of the law. Um, so that's just one example is, is, is elections and how critical that is to have a plan for. Uh, incident management, so this can range from an emergency situation to a special event. Both of those types of, of activities uh, end up with similar types of operations. Um, <coughs> when we have uh, 4th of July fireworks or holiday stroll, we set up a unified incident command post where uh, we have representatives from the different agencies involved and uh, work through issues that pop up during the event. The same thing goes for an emergency. Uh, we may respond out to assist an incident commander, so that would be somebody from fire or police, uh, with an incident that's uh, beyond their capabilities in the city. Uh, or we might open up uh, what we call our emergency operations center, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. <laughs> Uh, resource management, mutual aid, and logistics. So uh, one of the areas that our uh, department has historically been uh, involved in is the acquisition of equipment and supplies that are needed for emergency uh, response and recovery. Um, most recently, we've been involved in the acquisition of um, warm zone EMS supplies. So what that is uh, is supplies that can be used by uh, firefighters and EMS for an active shooter situation. Uh, that includes tourniquets and some specialized uh, pressure dressings um, in a format that enables them to, to quickly put that stuff on and be able to go into a scene and operate and remove people to get them to definitive care. Um, so we've done quite a bit of work around that through grant programs and, and putting those kits together and getting them deployed across the city. Uh, network, so as part of mutual aid and resource management, we partner with a number of community organizations. Uh, one being we're responsible for the maintenance of our local emergency planning committee. Uh, the local emergency planning committee is required by EPA for any community that has a hazardous materials team. And the idea behind a, uh, an LEPC is they're required to plan for how uh, the city would respond to a hazardous materials incident. Uh, we do that in partnership with the other regional communities that are part of the Sohegan Mutual Aid Response Team Network, uh, which ranges all the way from Bedford over to uh, Wilton. Uh, we've got uh, area all the way out to uh, um, Merrimack. Uh, we don't have Pelham, but uh, uh, we do go over to Hudson. So. 
Um, it's a pretty sizable area that is, that's provided service from the National Fire Rescue Hazmat Team, and we provide the planning component of that. Uh, we use that uh, committee not just for hazardous materials because that would be a waste of time. We do it for all hazards. So we talk about other types of emergencies and, and general all-hazard planning. The other group is our voluntary organizations active in disaster. Uh, that group is responsible for the uh, coordination with nonprofits, faith-based organizations, uh, social service groups uh, that we found after major disasters provide a significant amount of support to the community to help uh, citizens recover. Uh, and those both are meetings that are held quarterly at, at a staggered rate. Communications and warning. Uh, so there was a discussion uh, in the session prior to me about Code Red. Uh, we're responsible for the maintenance and operation of the Code Red notification system in the city. Uh, the Code Red system is a three-year contract that we have uh, through a, an outside vendor. Uh, and what it enables us to do is send out notifications via text message, voice call, uh, email address. Uh, we can send it out through social media. And it also has an integration with something called IPAWS, Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, which is a system through FEMA that enables us to be able to notify uh, phones that don't have the Code Red app installed on them, um, enables us to go over emergency alert systems. So that's the screeching noises that you hear on your uh, radio. This is only a test. Um, and then also uh, through NOAA weather radios. So it, it um, is basically one of those things where it's any port in a storm, we send it out to everything uh, because we need to be able to, to, to get legacy users that have only a landline telephone all the way to folks that are using social media. You cannot read this. I'm, I'm just, uh, I put this in the slide deck to show all the different communications uh, tools that are out there and available for the city of Nashville that we have access directly to be able to send out notifications. And that ranges from um, overriding cable television to uh, putting information up on the city website. So I'll let you look at that at your leisure. Facilities. So uh, the two pictures up there um, are what we would call our emergency operations center. Uh, and those are during activations for recent incidents. Um, if you've ever been to the, the police department's classroom, we set that classroom up into pods and um, have telephones, uh, computers, radios that we would set up. Uh, takes us time to put that together because it's not permanently set up. Uh, so it presents some challenges, particularly for a no notice event, which is what most of our events are. Um, one of the things that we've done uh, over the past year is we've worked with the police department to, to do some testing at an adjacent room that they have to the, to the classroom, uh, which is their, their computer training classroom. Um, still presents some challenges, but it does enable us to get on computers and phones much more quickly with uh, decision makers. Uh, so we do, we do operate both of those facilities. They're both at the police department. Uh, training, um, we provide training for uh, responders, public officials, um, all of our training programs are offered uh, to uh, regional communities as well. Um, so we're uh, kind of the headquarters for emergency training for our region. Um, and it's ranged from topics related to electrical safety to sandbagging to um, uh, incident command system, you name it, we've, we've done it. So that's something that we're regularly doing in the community. Exercises, evaluations, and corrective actions. So um, our office is not really involved in individual department training and exercises. So if the police department decides to do a training for their SWAT team, uh, we'll typically sit in on it and, and help where necessary. Our responsibility is multidisciplinary exercises. So if it's a, an exercise that involves multiple departments, uh, involves the state, um, we will be the ones that are coordinating that and developing the exercise plan. We do have a couple of exercises that we are planning in the coming months, um, and, and we're working on the, the planning for those right now. Uh, and I also just mentioned, um, related to that, any real life emergency, we also develop an after action report for as well to identify corrective actions and things that need to be improved in the city. Uh, and then the last uh, area that is noted in the accreditation program is the emergency public information and education. So uh, this is an area that uh, our public health uh, uh, division is responsible for. Um, that transferred last year, 
And the reason for that transfer was because um, across the rest of the state, public health, this is a responsibility of theirs. Uh, this unfortunately was the most fun of our programs because we got to interact quite a bit with the public, uh, but public health uh, through CDC grants is, um, is funded to do these types of initiatives. So they have some capable people uh, in the public health emergency preparedness program here in the city that are leading that effort and have taken charge of our community emergency response team program until help arrives and any outreach programs that are involved in the city. Uh, I briefly wanted to mention a, a pretty sizable project that we're currently working on. Um, and it, it involves a number of, of partners from around the country that have centered in on Nashua because we're really a test bed for a concept that we call community resilience. Um, so uh, National League of Cities, a number of federal agencies, um, we've got higher education partners that are helping us with research. Um, this is something that has been uh, in the works for a couple of years now and has finally taken off. Uh, so the Resilient Nashua Initiative uh, is four main parts. Uh, the first one being the development of a resilience strategy, which is funded through an EPA grant uh, to look at how we can develop programs in the city that have a benefit for emergency response and recovery, but also have a benefit for just community well-being. Um, it's a shift in the way that we look at emergency management rather than being reactive. It's how can we improve what we call the resilience dividend, uh, something that has a benefit for day-to-day -day operations and not just emergencies. Uh, and with that project, there'll be a couple of exercises, including a flood recovery exercise in 2019. Uh, the second component of it that's closely integrated is our five-year update to our hazard mitigation plan. Uh, and this is a project that's being uh, um, done in conjunction with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, this is being funded through a FEMA grant uh, and is a requirement to get mitigation funding from FEMA. Uh, and so we're up for our five-year update. Uh, the Resilience Dialogues is being uh, developed by the uh, Adapt Adaptation Society um, as well as the Thriving Earth Exchange, uh, looking at how we might be able to include green initiatives in our mitigation actions. Uh, and then the last one, which is barely readable up there, is a Resilience Integration Workshop, uh, which is done by Texas A&M. Um, and that's going to be to look at the different city plans that we have, everything ranging from economic development plans, mitigation plans, emergency plans, and the master plan to see what things conflict uh, and what things are uh, collaborative opportunities for us to reduce vulnerability in the city uh, and improve uh, development. And there's a number of activities that I'll let you read through on your on your own, but we've had a number of stakeholder meetings with uh, a number of community organizations ranging from the arts community to uh, the engineering department. Uh, so it's a very diverse set of stakeholders, but we've recognized that we need to get everybody's perspective in order to move this effort forward. So uh, there's not much change in my budget, um, but I did want to just talk a little bit about uh, long-term outlook for, for our department and, and some of the, the key concerns that we're looking at in the years to come. So grant management is one of the significant uh, responsibilities of our office. Uh, since 2011, when, when our office was established, uh, there have been 80 different grant programs uh, that we've been responsible for managing and maintaining, uh, and also five presidentially declared disasters. Uh, the reason I include that in grant management is those are technically grants from FEMA, post-disaster grants, so we have to manage them the same way that we would manage a, a grant for a piece of equipment. Uh, those are the most sizable grants that we end up dealing with and the most uh, frustrating and aggravating to deal with because we have to document every single expense that's been involved in some sort of a response and be able to demonstrate to FEMA that we use that funding appropriately. Um, so really what, um, what we're looking to do in the years to come is, is we're, we're reevaluating the value of grant programs for emergency management. Um, we've been very heavy on applying for grants. Um, and what we found, particularly along the lines of grants related to personnel costs, we end up spending more time in the writing, management, documentation of the grant, uh, which all has to be used with city municipal funding, because you can't use federal grants to apply for other federal grants, um, that it's really, it, it, it may not be worth the effort, particularly for the types of grants that we're applying for. $2,000 here, $3,000 here. It, it just it, it presents a lot of challenges for us. So um, one of the things that we're, we're, we're really struggling with is the our financial systems are really not meant to handle multiple streams of grant income to pay for somebody. If it's a formula-based um, 
appropriations. So we say this person's going to work 20% of their time for this grant, another 50% for this grant. The financial system does a pretty good job of doing that. That's not really accurate for the way that we manage grants. We may have a person that works all on one grant for one week. The next week, maybe split some hours up on this, split some hours up on that. Um, it is really challenging, particularly because we have to then connect their benefits to those appropriations um, each week. And it's, it's, um, it's a burden on... Uh, our administrative time, but also on financial services and payroll, and we're trying to reduce the burden on them as well. Um, the the other challenge with grant programs, and this is not just for human resources, but for for equipment as well, is uh, you know grants are carrots to local government. Um, they are ways to get you to adopt state and federal mandates to try and and promote their initiatives. And because of that, we have to be aligned with their, uh, their programs. Um, so all the grants that we apply for are, are project-based rather than program-based. So uh, we've been flexible and creative in years past to try and find ways to, to look at city priorities and align them to the priorities of other levels of government. Um, but it, uh, we're starting to run out of creative options to be able to use some of that funding. Um, so the other uh, and the last piece of this is, is we end up spending a lot more of that in-kind match time, which is typically my salary, uh, to do a lot of the work related to these grants, which really with the limited time that I have should be focused on city initiatives. Um, so we're, we're reevaluating grants um, and, and how we're applying for them, and that may impact the overall initiatives in the future. Uh, staffing. So uh, this kind of gives an overview of the staffing for our office. Um, uh, you've got myself, uh, which is full-time funded from the city. Uh, we have an emergency management coordinator, which is 20 hours a week, uh, which is a combination of municipal funding and, um, and grants. Uh, and then a new position that we ended up hiring um, uh, towards the end of last year, which is our community resilience coordinator. That position is fully grant funded through the programs that we had mentioned earlier as part of the, the Resilient Nashua Initiative. Um, some of the, the things that we're, we're looking at with this, we, we had put in a proposal um, to the mayor uh, to change the emergency management coordinator position to a full-time position, um, really to retain the existing employee that's, that's in that position. Uh, one of our, our most significant challenges is, um, is retaining people in part-time positions uh, without benefits. <laughs> Uh, and this is something that's not just unique to our department, but is common across any organization that has part-time positions. Um, and as you know, with that comes uh, the retraining of employees and um, presents a number of challenges related to that. So um, one of the things that we had looked to do with that position was really to, um, to add continuity of operations planning to their portfolio. Uh, to do more outreach in community organizations, so more technical assistance for businesses, nonprofits, churches that are looking to do emergency plans, um, and then also the responsibilities that currently exist within that position, which is the management of the logistics for our uh, local emergency planning committee and our VOAD program. Um, so uh, what will end up happening is, and, and I did provide some, some, some rough dates, rough estimate dates, um, July 2018, that position, the person is, is going to end up getting another position. We will not be looking to refill that position. Um, so that emergency management coordinator position will go away. Uh, the community resilience coordinator position uh, will last, based on our current grants that we have for that program, until June of 2019. Um, so uh, you know, some of the things that that, if we're looking uh, towards uh, coming years, um, really what it'll do is it'll focus just my position on emergency management. So that um, will be challenging, particularly for uh, a position to back me up, as well as the, um, you know, the other responsibilities related to if you've got two meetings at the same time, you can only go to one. Um, any grant projects that uh, that position was, was looking to fund in uh, fiscal year 19, we would look to push those back to uh, the state or federal agency that was going to provide them um, because it wouldn't be worthwhile to bring somebody on for $3,000, $4,000 for the, the upcoming fiscal year. Um, 
and then uh, long term with the emergency management director positions, that position was downgraded from 18 to 17. <coughs> so over the long term, there will be cost savings on that one as well. Um, so something to, to also note as, as we look into the, to the future. Um, the last piece was code red. So code red will be a significant component of our, our budget outlook for next year. Um, we're up for our three-year contract extension. So this will be our third three-year contract extension. Um, what we've done in the years past is we've convened a, uh, a working group of police, fire, IT, uh, and a number of other departments that have involvement in notifications, uh, really with the purpose of figuring out, does this make sense uh, to continue this service, to change the service, to eliminate the service, uh, and look at all the options that are available to us. Um, Right now, we have an unlimited program, and one of the things that we may decide is that uh, based, on, um, based on the usage of our program, it might make sense to go to a minutes-based uh, process where we would only be charged however many minutes we use per year. Uh, another process might be to just go to uh, a system that uses that federal IPAWS system, as we had mentioned, and eliminate the non-emergency messaging that we use. Um, the other thing that we may uh, look to do is to look at a little bit of, of how we might be able to collaborate with the city's website service. They have a notification platform, uh, which we may be able to experience some cost savings. I think Alderman McCarthy, at our last, uh, last update for this three years ago, we talked about um, maybe just using Blackboard Connect, which is the school system, and maybe looking at cost savings with that. So that's the purpose of this committee, is to really identify um, whether there are additional cost savings we can gain from, from this program. Last year, we, or not last year, but the last time we uh, negotiated this contract, uh, we were able to break it down from 36000 to 22000 which was a significant cost savings per year. Um, but we may be able to get even further cost savings beyond that. Uh, the other thing that may end up happening with that is we may look to consolidate that into the IT budget um, and remove that from emergency management since it's a uh, something that's similar to any other cloud-based service that the city maintains. So um, that kind of gives a, a longer-term outlook to, to our budget. Uh, for this year's budget, as discussed, there's not really any significant changes. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Oliver Lopez. Just a comment. I mean, it's a pretty cost-effective department for the enormous benefit that it returns both in monetary grants that we qualify for, but then also preventive services in case of an emergency. So are you entirely comfortable with having your department scaled down to you? <laughs> um, you know, there's, there is a... An intern? Yeah, and, and, and interns are work too. So, it, you know, interns are not free labor. It's, it, it requires professional development and, and really determining what projects they can be used for. We do have a great intern program, and we've had great interns come through. Um, there, there, are, there are challenges with the types of employees that we recruit, um, mainly because they're entry-level employees. Um, there are not many professionalized emergency management degree programs out there, and so there's a lot of learning on the job. And, and unfortunately, with this profession, there's also a pretty small group of people uh, for larger state emergency management agencies um, to recruit from. And so our folks get snatched up pretty quickly. Um, we, we, we lost both of our last employees around the same time. Uh, one ended up going down to Boston Public Health Commission, the other one uh, to the city of Manchester uh, in their fire department. And so um, that is just something we're going to run into based on the amount of, of funding that we pay uh, and the fact that it's a part-time job. I, I'm, I, I think that the, the concern that I have is there is no backup to to my position, um, so it, it just is me. Uh, but the city has, uh, in years past, they've had no emergency management director. So um, it all is about how we look at the responsibilities of emergency management and, and, and what its role is in the city government. Okay. Other questions? I just had a follow-up. Alderman Lopez. Um, so back up to you, I assume that we have AMR or National Fire or Police, if you're not available, there is a succession plan in that level where a department would take over. Or so, um, one of the things that we we're looking at is is as we try and 
and identify solutions to the staffing concerns that we have. Um, there's a lot of talk in, in municipal government about downshifting, the state downshifting responsibilities. Um, I think there may be an opportunity to upshift in this case where um, in the event that uh, we weren't able to provide the services necessary to support first responders during an incident because either we weren't here, weren't available, um, or it was beyond our capabilities, we would then request assistance from the state emergency management. Um, so that would probably be the, the more formalized solution as we move forward. Alderman Lopez. Sorry, last question, I swear. In that scenario, would the National Guard Reserve, since we have a training post on Daniel Webster, would they be a resource? Uh, the National Guard is a, a resource, uh, but re requires activation through the state government. They're, um, you know, they're an asset of, of the governor. Um, you can't just borrow them. <laughs> there are circumstances where you can borrow them, but it's within a certain time frame, and it has to be for really life safety concerns. Um, one of the challenges with the National Guard that we, we a lot of times talk about is what, what capabilities does that, that National Guard armory have? Uh, we actually talked about that uh, back during the, the winter of 1415, which was that bad one where we had tons of snow. And there was a big push to see if we can get the National Guard out to plow streets. They don't actually have those assets. There are armories um, in, in other places around the country that do have heavy equipment to do that kind of stuff, uh, but that, that local one does not. So um, in a lot of cases, that, arm, that armory, that local armory, is, is really there to for its domestic mission, really there for bodies to be able to assist with sandbagging or any number of different types of real simple activities, um, high water trucks, um, but they don't really have any specialized equipment that's useful for a domestic emergency response there. Thank you. Other questions? Alderman O'Brien. <clears throat> Thank you. A follow-up to Alderman Dodd, uh, Dow's inquiry. What is the purpose? Can code red system be used to help get word out for municipal reasons, mm -hmm. non-emergency, or is it strictly got to be an emergency situation? That's a great question. So, code red um, is available to anything that our imagination um, uh, requires. Uh, the challenge with code red uh, or any sort of notification system is. How often do you want to use it? Uh, because there are, are, are concerns that people will stop listening to the messages uh, for circumstances when we would need them to do it. We've made some changes over the past um, six years uh, where we've reduced the amount of, of circumstances where we would be overwhelming people with non-emergency calls. Uh, one way that we've been able to do that is through um, the usage of, of caller ID uh, modification. So now, rather than a 1-800 number, which was the way that the system was originally set up, we can change the phone number to the police department or the fire department. Uh, so people see that show up on their caller ID, if they have one, for a landline, and they would be more likely to pick it up. Um, that doesn't work for cell phones in a lot of cases. There are some cell phones that do have functionality of caller ID. Um, but a lot of them, it just shows up as a number. Um, even with that, though, I have had people uh, over the past, just recently, just within the past year, that have complained about various messages that may have been sent out, um, not nearly as much as it was when we first started the system. Um, but code red to a lot of the city departments, particularly public safety, really they want it to be used for just emergency use. When we acquired the system, it, it was built with all the functionality to allow it to be used for any purpose at all. Um, and we primarily use it for um, snow emergencies, and then to some extent we use it for um, information to citizens about some sort of an incident that's going on nearby them, pr primarily police or fire-related incidents. Um, other than that, uh, many of those non-emergency messaging um, uses that we've used over the years have been moved over to the, the city's website platform, the Notify Me platform, which is essentially free and part of our subscription for Civic Plus. It does have limitations. It doesn't have voice phone calls, but people can subscribe to meeting minutes of the budget committee if they wanted to and get a text message alert and an email alert. Uh, so there has been a shift to, to move a lot of those non-emergency things over to that. But on a 
elections there's only one or maybe two a year i don't think that would be a burden no I, and that's something that would be a discussion that um that we absolutely could have about the use of the system to benefit its value i mean it's a system that we we're paying for uh and if we find value in pushing out a message that could have the city clerk's phone number uh attached to it just a quick hey just letting you know that there's election today and Quite honestly, you could probably tie some public safety information to it, something to the extent be aware of additional traffic in the area of your uh, neighborhood polling location or, or something like that, uh, or a safety message. So to make it valuable to the citizens so that they feel like they weren't uh, spammed. So I, I'm open to that discussion. Well, certainly in a city of 90,000, we could probably get more than 3,000 out to vote. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is we have... Uh, some major arteries coming into Nashville that are going to be torn up and uh, will be traffic issues. Are we going to use this to announce that? We have. We, we have used it for significant traffic issues. So um, uh, probably about three years ago when we were up for our last, um, our last uh, um, contract, we, we brought together the notifications committee and talked about the types of messages that are sent out and, and, and whether we wanted to change any of that. And one of the things that we had decided was that we would only send out construction notices or uh, construction or, or even road closure notices, maybe due to a large accident or, or something like that, for what we would call the, the collector roads, so major arteries in the city. So we wouldn't do something for you know, Eldridge Street but we would do something for the numbered routes or for, um, you know, Ald Street, Harbor Ave, something that's going to impact a significant number of, of travelers. You know, I would suggest getting together with the BW because uh, very soon we'll be tearing up Kinsley Street, Hammer Street, Concord Street, <coughs> East Hollis Street, West Hollis, whatever other ones is. All the major arteries are going to be repaved, so... Yeah, th those those would those would certainly meet the criteria that was developed by the team, um, and uh, there's a new public relations administrator over at Public Works who's um, very familiar with the system and its capabilities, and, and would be able to assist in the the message development for for notifications that would go out. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Want me to leave it up? <coughs> Good evening. My name is uh, Bill Mansfield. I'm the radio system manager for the city. Um, I think most of you did receive this PowerPoint as well. And here it goes. Here we go. Maybe. There you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. So the citywide communications division consists of two employees, one being a part-time employee working 32 hours a week and one being a full-time employee working 40 hours a week. Uh, I am the part-time employee. Uh, my office is located over at the National Police Department, where the uh, main brains of the radio communication system are. Uh, the other gentleman, uh, who's currently out on medical leave, uh, is over at the uh, stationed at the fire, fire department on Lake Street. Um, it's going to be it's going to be even difficult for me to read what is up there. So, uh, like I said, it consists of two people. Uh, the division's responsible for ensuring all uh, city entities have their radio communications. If you take that mouse and move it over to the right of the presentations out in that gray area, and now click on it. Yeah, it's. Should be a PowerPoint, so. It's not I a. Mean, it should be a. Enlarge. Place to enlarge it. Oh, there, there you go. Is. For those that are visually challenged, including myself. <laughs> Just brought a telescope. <laughs> the um, uh, so we maintain the radio system. The two of us, uh, seven days a week, twenty-four hours a day, three hundred sixty-five days a year. Um, if uh, something goes wrong with the system, we are usually called or notified 
the, the first uh, line of defense to uh, come in and try to figure out what the issue is. Uh, we're also uh, responsible for all interoperability communications within the city as, as well as uh, maintaining the interoperability with other communities surrounding the city of Nashua. Uh, the city uh, wide uh, communication system consists of uh, our own independent uh, radio network. Uh, the network is linked by fiber uh, at all the sites and the facilities. It's also linked by microwave. We have uh, four microwave communication links, um, which are attached to towers throughout the city. Uh, we have two dispatch sites, one over at fire and one over at police. Each of those sites have three uh, dispatch consoles in them, uh, two a man 24 hours a day. Uh, the third one is, is a backup console and utilized for special events at each location. There are approximately 1,200, 800 megahertz portable radio in the city. 800 megahertz, that's the radio system that we have. Uh, the, the surrounding communities around us are on VHF, or very high frequency. Um, we have 400 VHF mobile and portable radios throughout the city as well. Those are mainly in fire apparatus and police, uh, police uh, vehicles. Uh, plus, we also have the redundant fiber optic network. network. There's a radio committee in the city. Uh, basically, when major uh, decisions come up uh, that need to be made, we convene. Uh, Alderman McCarthy uh, is part of that committee. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief Rhodes, uh, the police department has uh, Chief Lavoy or his designee. We have police IT involved. We have uh, the, uh, the CFO for the city. Uh, IT here at City Hall, emergency management uh, with Justin Cates, the DPW, and of course the two uh, the two employees for the division. System users, all firefighters and all police officers are issued portable radios. Uh, all the cruisers, uh, all the fire trucks, every piece of apparatus has um, radio equipment in it. Uh, we're responsible for uh, maintaining the ability for the ambulance company to uh, communicate on our radio system because they communicate directly with fire for the most part for uh, their response. Uh, they do pay for their own radios and their own maintenance. Uh, we have all DPW divisions. They have portable and mobile radios in all the vehicles. Um, the schools currently, uh, National High School North and National High School South uh, as well as plant operations are the only schools that have radios uh, operating on them at this point in time. Uh, each of the schools has approximately 30 radios. Uh, each of the high schools has approximately 30 radios, and plant operations has about the same. Uh, the city's transit sy system operates on it, the health department, community development, uh, as well as emergency management. Lovely pictures of... Uh, Two of our tower sites, one's the, uh, in the uh, north end, one is in the west end. The, the one on the right-hand side is a city-owned tower uh, that's located in the south end of the city. Uh, the only things that are on that particular tower are uh, related to public safety. Uh, it's police, fire, um, there are other entities on that, federal entities, uh, as well as the National Guard. The, the left tower is one that is uh, uh, located at one of a city-owned facility. Uh, it's a cell tower. We have a spot on that cell tower where we have a microwave dish and an antenna. Um, and we also have a building uh, right below it where all the uh, radio equipment is housed. Uh, next pictures are the uh, radio infrastructure. Um, on the left-hand side is uh, your typical site. Uh, down the far end is uh, all the radio uh, um, radio receivers, radio repeaters, uh, and then moving up, it moves up to the microwave and batteries. And on the, uh, the right-hand picture is a picture of all the batteries at the site. All the sites are backed up by battery as well as generator. Uh, they are all air-conditioned and heated as well. We have one site that uh, is becoming, a <laughs> becoming an issue this year. Um, this site is uh, on mount. Uh, the antennas are mounted on a, a water tank. That particular water tank is coming down next year, 
So we are looking at options of what we can do to maintain that particular site. We can't just take the site and put it out of service. Um, all, uh, all three sites that we have in the city, uh, they synchronize together. They're all uh, maintained by GPS clocks. And if you lo lose one of those sites, you lose a major proportion of your coverage in the city. The coverage in the city, in-building coverage, is approximately 97 to 99%. So we have a very limited amount of areas within the city that we do not have any coverage in. Very small. There is a tank that's going to replace that tank. It's there is the interim that you may need some. Correct. Correct. And the well, we'll just we'll discuss that later. The problem is getting the height that we need yeah. for that. So, uh, here's just a photo of some of the radio equipment that we uh, maintain. Um, the, the portable radios in the background and, and the, the the mobile radios uh, in the foreground. A couple photos of the uh, police dispatch and fire dispatch. <coughs> Photo of the lovely equipment shelters we have. Uh, like I said, each, each of the sites is uh, backed up by battery as well as generator. Two of the sites have similar buildings like this where the generator is over here on the right-hand side and it has propane, uh, propane gas that is uh, feeding the, uh, the system for when a power failure occurs. And looking at the budget, so for the most part, the, the budget has made, been level funded for many years. Um, what we have done is moved uh, funding from one area to another area to make up whatever the, the difference may, may need to be made up with. Except for this year, I, I specifically brought this out, which was uh, line item 54435, and it's the communications equipment maintenance. <clears throat> so. In 2015, the city upgraded their radio system. They spent approximately $9 million on upgrading the radio system. Uh, the system is, like I said, its own network. Uh, everything is computerized now. Uh, to ensure our system remains up to date, just like Microsoft, QuickBooks, or anything like that, you have to uh, upgrade your systems on a frequent basis. Um, to, to keep our system uh, viable, uh, we, this, the, uh, the radio committee in, in the city has uh, chosen to uh, go with what we call a SUA2 plan, which means that every two years our radio system will be upgraded. And it's, it's a system upgrade agreement. That upgrade agreement is very expensive. It was not in last year's budget. Uh, it was added in um, at the end of the um, budget year. Uh, but it was not listed on the budget itself. Uh, this year it has been added to the budget so that we can continue maintaining this. So last year we paid, the reason why it's in yellow, we paid the $191,000, $192,000 uh, for the system upgrade agreement for the first year. Uh, this year, if the budget passes, we'll, we'll pay the second year. And by next spring, we'll, be, we'll have the upgrade uh, from what we call uh, 7.15 to 7.17. So our system will be pretty much up to, up to date where it needs to be today. Uh, with these updates, it not only gives you an extended period of time for your system to uh, be viable, um, but it also gives you uh, enhancements to the, to, the, uh, to the radio system, which allows more things to be put into radios uh, for, for safety or whatever it may be. Um, and one of the biggest features on this particular uh, upgrade is that uh, the fire department will have the capability um, for a fee to uh, purchase a accountabil accountability software where uh, when they're at a fire scene, instead of re doing a roll call with everybody and having everybody key up their radios while they're in the middle of a fire, uh, what they would do is send out a tone to the radios and all a firefighter would have to do is click his radio and it would automatically account for that firefighter on the scene. It reduces the amount of air, t air time being taken up um, over the radio, wa radio waves. So this year, the, the, uh, the maintenance has been uh, increased by that $194,000. Next year, we'll come in, we'll ask for $196,000 and it keeps going up. I put all six years for that maintenance contract. 
current and, and upcoming projects. Uh, we already spoke a little bit about the, uh, the water tower, the water tank, trying to relocate the, uh, the antennas on that particular tank. Uh, we're also in the, in the midst of uh, building a uh, redundant radio communication system. And what that is is uh, up in Manchester, Manchester has a similar system to the city of Nashua. So we received a $600,000 grant, $300,000 for Nashua and $300,000 for Manchester, to build a communication center just in case something catastrophic happens here in the city of Nashua as well as in the city of Manchester. It's a separate building. It has its own generators. Um, it has its own, own power. We don't have any real maintenance costs on the building because it is um, uh, being main, maintained by a city organization up in Manchester. Um, we hope to, uh, I think, finance this week. We'll, uh, I think the first purchase that we're trying to come through is on a uh, purchasing a generator for uh, the tower at that site to uh, ensure that we have power uh, yeah, if, we, if there's a power outage up there. That project, I hope to get the purchase order to, uh, in here uh, to finance for the, the main part of the project by the middle of May, and we'll see how that goes. Um, and we'll kick that off and hopefully start doing installation of that system by July. Included in this is uh, this grant was uh, licensing. Our radio system, for every radio that's on the system, it has to be licensed. So somebody from a neighboring town cannot just come here and uh, turn their radio, put a radio frequency in there, turn the radio on it, and come on our radio system. Uh, there is a security key uh, for every one of the radios that is out there. Uh, it's the same with Manchester. They have the same type of system. Uh, our licenses, we have 2,000 licenses on the system for our radio system. I'm down to 19, um, I think, I believe I have... As of today, 18 licenses left. Tomorrow, I'm going to be programming 100 state police portable radios with our uh, radio system in it. They cannot get on our radio system until we purchase uh, the equipment for this redundant communications project, because then there's 2,000 extra licenses. So these other entities, such as the state police, such as um, Grafton County, Rockingham County, they all have caches of radios that can talk on our radio system. We have to touch their radios, we have to program their radios, and then we have to allow them on our system. So that's why uh, the state has allowed us and the federal government has allowed us to, to uh, purchase the additional 2,000 licenses so we can do that. Uh, we're going to be doing a, it's going to be put on hold at the minute, uh, but we're go going to be upgrading all the software um, in the mo mobile and portable radios for both police and fire uh, because of the fact that I'm alone probably for the next six to 12 weeks um, that's being pushed on the back burner unless I can find a, uh, a radio shop that can uh, allow somebody to come out for that period of time and, and help to start programming those radios and replacing the batteries. <clears throat> I have uh, asked two different radio shops and they told me that they can give me one person maybe one day a week, maybe. Uh, we need something that's consistent where they can be here every day and to do all the programming. Still working on it. Uh, we're continuing to work with uh, radio interoperability uh, committees. Uh, we work with the state uh, radio interoperability committee. Uh, also, uh, I work with Region 19, uh, which is the FCC Region 19, and that's uh, dealing with uh, not only radio frequencies, but also um, uh, interoperability. Uh, our radio infrastructure upgra upgrade by, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, that'll be another project. And then trying to continue the day-to-day uh, -to -day operational maintenance of uh, running around, putting out fires, not literally, uh, at the different agencies within the city to troubleshoot radios, reprogram radios, uh, uh, get re repair radios, or s ship them to the radios to be repaired. And then finally, the, the last slide which you all have is all uh, the different agencies that we have uh, dealt with over the past year uh, and that we're continuing to deal with, and also the different uh, organizations that we belong to to keep up to date with uh, the, not only technology but uh, changing trends, with, uh, especially with interoperability. So. Okay. Questions?
Spanish? <coughs> so something you just mentioned. Um, if the ambulance companies maintain their radios, do they have anybody who can help you program them? Uh, we have to program them because we have the uh, the uh, the key to program them. Uh, it's only the ambulance company here in Nashua that we do, we do that for because they are working for us as a city. I just meant what you referenced, where you're trying to get radio shops who have extra people. Um, they don't. The problem is we we operate a what we call a trunked radio system, and most radio shops do not have the staff that is knowledgeable enough to work on a trunked radio system even to program the radios because you have to put specific IDs in, you have to use certain keys. It's, it's a complex uh, programming process that we go through. Most of your radio shops are not familiar with that, um, so they don't ha and they don't have the personnel to let go to do that. Uh, the radio shop that we deal with is out of Newington, New Hampshire. There's another one out of uh, uh, northern New Hampshire. Um, and there's also one out of New York that I'm, I'm dealing with, and that's probably my best option right now to get somebody in here to help with the, uh, the programming. Can I just ask if the trunk system is so difficult to maintain because it is so cutting edge, hopefully? It's not cutting edge. It's the, uh, the technology that's behind it with um, most of your departments, they operate on, let's say, I'll, I'll talk about Hudson. Hudson has like three different channels that they operate on. Those channels are actually radio channels. So there's a radio channel that's assigned to it. Our radio system is 10 radio channels that are shared by everybody. And the way that they're shared by everybody is we, um, we have talk groups on, on them. So the police department has, I'll say, 10 different talk groups that they, they can talk on. The way the system works, the fire has the same uh, the health department has theirs, the DPW, so they all have different talk groups. They're sharing those channels, so it's like a, a trunked phone system. So when you call into a phone bank, if you, you're calling, let's say you call 594-3500, that's the police department. Well, that first license is now taken up. The next person that calls in then calls in the second one. It could be a fire call calling in the third one. So it, it just rotates down the line till you take up all 10 channels. Um, and that prevents busies uh, in the system. The way the city used to operate was the DPW had their own radio, uh, radio system. They had one channel. It wasn't enough for them, so they needed to join the rest of the city with this trunked radio system. Uh, that's one example. The school department, they had different, uh, a different channel. The police department had three channels, which was not enough for them. The fire department had I believe two channels, that wasn't enough of them. So us allowing people to operate on this trunked radio system allows us to share those 10 channels and not have to have any more than those 10 channels to, uh, to operate. So it, it is complex. It's more integrated, but the cost is it's more complex to manage. Yes, and it's, it is more expensive as well. Any other <clears throat> questions? When we do... Um, um, shared service with other fire departments and they come into town, is there any communication issue? So um, we also maintain VHF radio channels here in the city with police and fire. So the uh, fire department has two channels and the police department has one channel. So the, for the most part, mutual aid with agencies coming into the city, uh, it's mainly used by the fire department. And they would call in on their VHF radio channel, which is programmed to Nashua because they have that channel in their system. And they would hit fire dispatch. Fire dispatch can then patch them over to our radio system. And all the communications goes back and forth over. It's going over both channels, but it's only one person talking at a time going over both channels. So we, we really don't have a problem with that. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, that handles all of the groups for tonight. Uh, do I have a motion? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a motion to table R18019, which is the budget. 
All right, the motion on the floor is to table R-18019 to the next budget meeting. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. General discussion? Uh, did everyone get word that tomorrow night's meeting is canceled? Or moved, actually. Mm -hmm. And the new schedule was put out by Sue, so uh, there were actually two meetings that have moved and um, for different reasons. Okay. So just consult with the schedule so you know when to uh, be here for fun and games again. Okay, uh, public comment, general comment? Yes, Alderman Lopez. I just wanted to point out, especially to the at-large alderman, that there is a town hall meeting for Ward 4 at Amherst Street School at 7 p.m. tomorrow. So, I mean, if your schedule's free, you should come by. So one of the reasons that we moved the meeting because of the particular topics being discussed at that meeting. So, okay, no public comment. Remarks by the alderman. None. We don't need a non-public. Do I hear a motion? Motion. <coughs> motion by Alderman Wilshire to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned at 9-10.